terms of history and talking about the various institutions uh, of the European Union. Uh, today is primarily going to be law. So for those of you who are really excited about the law school you didn't have, um, this will be a moment for you to uh, really experience that. And for those who are uh, not legal scholars, which is fantastic, um, uh, Aaron and I will try to uh, bring the law down to pertinent examples and relevant cases so you can su so you can understand where we're coming from and uh, what's actually going on in terms of the functional relationship between the law and the day-to-day -day lives of European citizens. And, and, and I think it's really important, um, you know, we, we wouldn't normally in any sort of um, uh, supranational um, organizations uh, or institutions focus this much on the law, but in some ways, um, it, it, that is really what the EU is now is a is a is a regional supranational uh, legal organization that is um, really co. Uh, a determinant in terms of 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 law and and and, and legal structure in everyday uh, uh, EU citizens' uh, uh, lives, and I and I think it's it, it's pretty clear that that is uh, the larger, higher trajectory of the EU's evolution, especially over the next uh, two, three, four decades. Um, and and then we can also bring in you know some of the some color around. Um, what's what's shaped this? You know the the, the failure of the of the constitutional uh, system development in the in the two thousands, and and so on. So you know, I just wanted to to put that out there because I think yeah. someone would be like, most people would be like, why you know why would I care about this? And right, that, no the the, the legal development. Uh, this is one of the interesting things that sort of separates the European Union from the project of, for example, the United States. Right, where in the United States. If you look at the period from 1781, when the Battle of Yorktown was won, until 1790, you have those 10 years. And in that 10 year period, you had a number of different legal changes and instrumentations as the Articles of Confederation demonstrated that they couldn't hold together the union and the constitution was promulgated and eventually ratified in the in, uh, by the end of 1790. Um, this is an incredibly quick process with one substantial set of legal changes, but you don't have an evolution of intermediate products that occur over a number of generations as the institutions behind them change and modernize. This is exactly the opposite of the EU. The EU is consistently changing the legal system by which it operates. And so imagine if we had a constitutional referendum in the United States every 40 years, right? That would be the equivalent situation yeah. of what's going on in the EU, where people would be like, okay, wait, look, the Senate does this. Why, why is the Senate suddenly doing that? And why do, are we suddenly adding a House of Representatives? And uh, why are why is the federal government now suddenly collecting our taxes, right? So you have all these different. Why do we have three? Yeah, why do we have three new pre, uh, presidents of, of variant committees, right? And, yeah, exactly. And, and 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 so there's almost a better analogy, is the development of 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 French administration from from 1796 to you know 18 I guess it would be about 70, 75, 80. Uh, maybe yes, 1780. I think it is. Um, yeah, the, you know, the first republics. Yeah, exactly. And so, so you have this sort of. Um, I mean, it's not as chaotic, obviously, as that. But, but, but it 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 presents a similar story of this very slow moving. Um, you know, either either there's friction and it stops for a while, but it always is going in one direction, right? It's it's always going to more uh, supranational. Of uh, uh, you know legal authority and and development, it's just it's a question of sort of speed and pace and time. So I guess this is where we'll start, right? So um, welcome to the third in our series on the European Union. Uh, as we've just been discussing, this will be a discussion on the legal organization and instrumentation of the European Union. Um, I'm going to do it primarily from a current lens, but of course we will talk about some of the stuff that led up to that current situation. So as we've discussed, right, from a legal perspective, the European Union is not organized 
as exclusively one set of compacts, as one set of agreements, right? So you've got the countries that are EU member states, right? Those are any country that has sort of blue in it, um, right? If it's brown, if it's purple, if it's green, right? All these colors with blue are all part of the European Union somehow. But you can also see that there are countries that don't have blue in them, right? The red color, the red colored countries, the black colored countries, the yellow colored countries, uh, the orange colored countries. And that's because those countries have some kind of relationship with the European Union, but aren't actually members of the European Union. And so they maintain this sort of legal relationship with it that's not entirely unified, but at the same time um, maintaining, for example, if we look at the red colored countries, uh, Iceland, Norway, uh, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland, these countries are what are called uh, EFTA countries, they're also part of the Schengen Agreement, which is how they're labeled on this map, but they're uh, European, free trade, uh, yeah, European Free Trade Agreement countries, which means that the European Union has a trade situation that is stabilized with these countries. Um, and because they're part of Schengen, you have the free movement of people, but surprisingly, you don't have the free movement of goods, right? They're not part of the common market. They have a relationship with the common market. So what does that mean on a, on a day-to-day -day basis? For the people in these countries. What it basically means is that people can freely move across the borders of these countries and the European Union countries. However, the things that they carry with them are subject to the rules of the common market. So between Norway and Sweden, for example, there is a border as opposed to in other places in the European Union where there would be no border. But the border is only for items not for human beings. So you don't need to demonstrate that you have the right to cross the border, but you do have to demonstrate that your things have the right to cross the border. So if there is an excise tax on cigarettes, for example, that tax would have to be paid at the border. Um, and so you have this sort of strange relationship, right, between EU member states and EFTA states. You also have situations like, for example, if you look at Kosovo and Montenegro, these the two yellow states on the map, these are countries that are not part of the European Union, but use the euro as their financial currency. So they're tied to the European economic system, right? They can't change the amount of euros in circulation. And in many cases, euros are brought to these countries because as you see, they border uh, no countries that use the euro themselves. The closest they come is to bordering Croatia, which is an EU member state, but an EU member state that doesn't use the euro. And in order to accede to euro usage, you can see that there are a number of EU member states that lack yellow in their coloration, right? The ones that are blue, the ones that are purple. Um, these are states that don't use the euro. And they don't use the euro because they haven't met all the qualifying legal requirements to use the euro. So for example, if we look at Poland, we have a country that has been an EU member state since 2004, and yet still uses the złote, which is their own currency, as opposed to the euro. And there are different situations. Some of, in some cases, these countries have a peg, meaning that their currency is linked to a certain number of euros. Um, and I think Denmark is a good example of this. The Danish crown is pegged to the euro. And so it's something like 50 Danish crowns uh, per euro. But you have other countries like Hungary, where their currency is not pegged to the euro. And so there is some fluidity. The Hungarian economy could go up or down relative to the European economy. And you won't see um, uh, and you won't see a consistent exchange rate. I have a question uh, that says, what do you mean with don't use the euro? Uh, they use their own currencies. Um, remember, the transition to the euro was a process. There were 12 countries in the European Union originally, which instituted the euro, but other countries in the European Union don't have the economic situation according to the Copenhagen Agreement, and we can get a little into that if you want, um, to implement the euro. They don't have the economy that is in exactly the right criteria, and so they haven't been allowed to transition to the euro. But the transition to the euro, even for the countries where the economic situation is in alignment with the Copenhagen Agreement, it's not immediate. It takes time because the first thing that needs to happen is that the local currency needs to be pegged to the euro. Yeah. And, 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 and the, then there's a bunch of 
specific requirements on uh, government budgeting and on, um, in, in essence, debt to GDP ratios to just make it really simple. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff, but if you get your debt to GDP ratio appropriate, then you can sort of begin the process of, you want to think of it as almost as Euro ascension, which is different than sort of EU ascension. It's not quite mapped out the same way, which I think is a huge mistake because it's actually probably the most disciplined path and in many ways should probably be the first path that countries take, not sort of the last path, uh, because I think you could Euroize your economy faster and that would actually drive a huge amount of the statutory and regulatory uh, uh, cohesion and adherence just out of, you know, human nature of, you know, people wanting to do things that work right. uh, versus now, not doing things that work. This is the opposite where you're sort of imposing the statutory regulatory and you're still in your old world and there's all this friction and conflict, you know, that's that you have to sort of basically push through. Um, Absolutely. Um, no, uh, we have a follow-up question saying, can you give an example? So they sell something to a Euro country, what do they get paid in? Well, this is the same for any kind of international trade, right? If, if I sell something uh, in, from an American to a Canadian, right? So we're completely out of the EU system. We're doing a normal uh, international arrangement, right? If I make my goods here in America and I sell them in Canada, the Canadian is going to pay me in Canadian dollars because that's the legal currency in Canada. And so then I have to take those Canadian dollars as let's say a furniture maker, right? I've sold my, uh, my sofa in Canada. I go to the bank and I say, okay, I have 500 Canadian dollars. I want to convert that to American currency because I'm coming back to the United States. I want to be able to pay my rent and other expenses in the United States. And they'll, for my 500 Canadian dollars, they'll give me what? 300 or so American dollars, whatever the exchange rate is that day. And then I'll go home. And that's exactly what happens um, in these EU states that are not on the Euro, right? Um, for example, I have a friend, she's Hungarian and she works in Austria. So she gets paid in euros because her job is in Vienna. So she takes those euros and she puts them in her bank account in Austria. And if she wants to withdraw those funds in Hungary, she needs to convert those funds from euros into foreigns, um, which, and, is the, and, which is the Hungarian yeah. currency. And as I was explaining before, right, in Denmark, there's a peg, there's a, that a certain amount of Danish crowns is always the same as a certain number of euros. That's not the same with Hungary. Hungary hasn't reached the economic position yet where it can even attempt the peg. So she doesn't well, yeah, and, know and, how much money she's earned in foreigns because she's paid in euros. And, and, a, and a quick piece to this is that the Danish approach really ultimately means that their uh, central banking and Ministry of Finance are directly aligned with the ECB policy. And actually you could argue are even um, sort of more aggressive than the ECB policy because they have to stay, you know, let's say half a step ahead. And ultimately one of the challenges in a place like Hungary uh, is that uh, they're oftentimes not just one step behind, but two or three, because right now it's like 350, 356, I think it is for instance to the, to the Euro. And I can give you kind of a concrete example. The General Electric invested an enormous amount of money in, in Hungary uh, for, for several decades, independent of sort of other challenges GE had, uh, but in terms of, of, of their production. And a lot of it was based on really the full Hungarian um, ascension into the EU. Um, and ultimately what they wound up doing is migrating a huge amount of that to Poland. Uh, because basically the Polish track into the EU be, was just more more stable and 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 the integration into Germany, and and that's like a, that's an example of 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 some of the unintended uh, costs. And and one one other quick point here, this is the very elementary school version of these European organizations because we didn't even build the security version of this, which is. Easily it's twice more as complicated, complicated. Yeah, yeah. Easily twice as complicated as this. Uh, probably fifteen to twenty more variations. Um, you know, th than you see here. 
So um, we have a comment that um, most companies have a dollar, uh, dollar denominated or Euro uh, shipping account. Um, and, but when you, and that's correct. Most large companies will have either British pound denominated, Euro denominated um, or, uh, or dollar denominated accounts. But when it comes to these smaller currencies like the Zwolta in Poland, the Koruna in Czech Republic, the Levs in Bulgaria, these are not accounts that large businesses will have. And so if you're withdraw, if you're being paid in euros, which is the dominant situation in Europe for mul large multinational corporations, and you go back to your country, then you need to exchange it. Right. Um, we also have a comment um, from somebody who was working in the Netherlands saying that um, when they were shipping uh, bulbs from the Netherlands to Italy, uh, Italy had devalued the lira after the shipment was sent but before they paid. So they wanted to pay the supplier in lira, which would have been half the value. And yeah, so, so what that does is add hedging costs, which was right. one of the things that in principle, the EU really solves or the Euro solves is that you get the, the, the and, and you want to think of hedging as just insurance, right? That's a yeah. simple way to look at right. it. So, I mean, so you get to get rid of the insurance cost when everybody's in the Euro, assuming their monetary and GDP to debt ratios are are in in the same general band, right? That's right. The, that's the real key. Well, uh, well, I I wanted to bring up the story that was brought up in the comments specifically because the benefit of the common market with the common currency is that a euro is a euro is a euro, right? So my Canada U.S. situation of having to go and convert my Canadian dollars back to American dollars. Um, when I sell in Canada is a very different situation than, for example, in the United States. If I go from New York to New Jersey and I want to sell my furniture, the person will pay me in American dollars and I don't have to convert that to anything. I can go back to New York and pay my rent. Right. Um, and that's what the euro does. Right. So the situation of the possible devaluation of the lira that will lead to issues in, in exchanging money with guilders in, in Netherlands, that all evaporates because a euro is a euro is a euro uh, across the various states of the European Union. And that's why the entry into the euro is so complicated from an economics perspective in order to make sure that all these states are on the economic footing, that they can maintain the long, same long-term goals in terms of their organization. One of the other things I wanted to highlight on this map are the black states, right? Uh, Serbia, uh, Macedonia, uh, sorry, North Macedonia, um, Albania, and Turkey. Um, these states uh, and I believe Montenegro as well, um, because Montenegro is a mix of a black state and a yellow state. That's why it's a little darker. Um, these states are what are called active candidates, which are countries that are trying to accede in some way to the European Union um, and currently have not been accepted. Right. Uh, we talked a little bit during uh, the history uh, piece about the Maastricht Treaty and the Copenhagen criteria. And those criteria um, are required for an, a, a candidate that wants to be a member of the European Union to follow in order to be accepted as a European Union member state. So we end up with the situation, right, where we have states like Turkey, which is the most famous one, that has been knocking on the EU's door since 1978, before it was even called the EU, right? We talked about how that was still the European communities at that point. But Turkey hasn't fulfilled all the requirements of the Copenhagen criteria since that point, and so they haven't been allowed to enter. All right. So we discussed uh, last time the sort of the origins of the, of the European Union through the coal and steel community, then the treaties of Rome and Eurotom. In fact, the Treaty of Rome will be amended several times since its uh, publication in 1957 and will be known as the TFEU, the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union in its current uh, situation, which we're going to rely on in several instances regarding the legality of a number of institutions. We then have that Schengen Agreement, right? That free movement across European states, which combined with the Euro, Right, is an incredibly powerful ability to move across numerous countries with the same currency and basically do what, commercially speaking, we do in the United States all the time, right? Drive across state borders, buy things in different locations, sell things in different locations with no customs or borders between the various states. Now, in the United States, we've had this system pretty much since the dawn of 
colonization in the United States, with the exception of the money issue. The money issue is a little different, but in terms of travel, a New Jerseyan during the British colonial period could easily travel to Virginia during the colonial period. Um, and so the development of that was not so difficult. In, the, in Europe, of course, that's not the case. It was never the case that a German could, e uh, from, even somebody from Prussia could easily waltz into uh, Dusseldorf, right? That required the creation of these national confederations and agreements and, uh, and alignments. So uh, we should understand from a legal perspective just how complex this organization of, of movement actually was. And then uh, this is where we get into the Copenhagen criteria, right? So, so we can drill down a little bit more from the legal perspective. Under the Treaty of Maastricht, which has become part of the European Union, um, you have, and the Treaty of Maastricht is also known as the Treaty of the European Union. Um, so we're going to see that reference also. Now, the Copenhagen criteria requires several different things to be in operation at the same time. So the first one is that we have to have a stability of institutions to, uh, guaranteeing democracy, rule of law, human rights, and respect and protection of minorities. As soon as we see this, uh, we can understand pretty clearly why Turkey has been, since 1978, held at the edge of the European Union, right? We have numerous rule of law issues in Turkey, um, especially more recently with Erdogan. We have numerous minority respect issues, especially when it comes to the Kurds in Turkey. We have numerous protection of minority issues, um, such as, for example, the Assyrian community that keeps losing their churches, uh, the churches got into Turkish governmental confiscation. And of course, we have issues with guaranteeing democracy in Turkey. The voting systems in Turkey are less than stellar. And, and, and one other thing too, that is I think often missed is that um, Europe has a very, and we can go into this in a future uh, uh, episode, they have a very stringent uh, view of any incorporation into any European institution uh, with any state that has any uh, active conflict of any kind. And yeah. so Turkey has an active conflict, obviously, in southern Turkey with a uh, variant uh, Kurdish uh, nationalist and, uh, and and freedom fighting and sort of uh, revolutionary movements. And, and also so, the occupation of the north of Cyprus. That's right. And then and then the whole separate, you know, uh, sort of at this point, almost fiasco, given uh, what it's really worth versus <laughs> how much energy uh, both parties are willing to put into it or now almost three, four, five parties. But but it's and obviously it's worth something to them. So I, I'm not I'm not making light of that. I'm just pointing out that, you know, the the, the scale of trillion dollar benefits to uh, to Turkey, uh, you know, is 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 quite minimized by by those uh, conflicts. But 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 that speaks to sort of the the gaps that you have, not just in Turkey, but in other places, uh, you know, whether it's Ukraine or or eventually Belarus or, you know, other other states, uh, anyone with some type of frozen conflict of any kind um, is sort of stuck until they unfreeze the conflict, no pun intended. Yeah, no, and, and when I mean the stability of institutions guaranteeing democracy, we're not strictly meaning, can a person vote on who their politicians are? We're talking about things like competitive airtime for different political parties on the, on the radio waves and on television. We're talking about the ability of people to petition the government uh, freely uh, without fear of recrimination. So it's not strictly the vote. They're looking for the actual uh, ambiance, if you want to call it that, of Western style democracy. Now I have a question of what does it mean to lose a church? Um, when I'm saying that the church and the Turkish government is confiscating Assyrian churches, I mean that in the most literal sense of, um, uh, somebody help me with the name, uh, when the government takes your land. Oh, uh, like uh, eminent, eminent domain. domain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's actually eminent domain. So we've had a number of different issues in the 20, from between 2016 and 2019. So this is very recent, um, where the Turkish government has used the process of eminent domain to take churches away from the Assyrian community and reapportion them to other people in society. Now, typically the understanding of eminent domain 
in most Western countries is that there should be um, a legal process, basically. Uh, yeah, that the, the, yeah. uh, there's a legal process that they've been giving uh, some of these churches to Islamic institutions to use as as uh, Islamic institutions. Um, and we have a comment of uh, that uh, basically that Turks aren't being allowed to enter the European Union because they're Muslims. Um, there is certainly that argument that is made externally to the law as to what's motivating European Union leadership. And that may well be a consideration considering that the population of Turkey is around 79 to 80 million people. And the average age in Turkey is significantly lower than the average age of the European Union, meaning that there would be a large amount of migrant workers, right? You'd have that Schengen situation. Um, uh, and you would have at least when you join the European Union freedom of movement. So that, that could be a possibility. But even, but if that were the only reason that Turkey were being excluded uh, strictly on these sort of external cultural bases, it would be very hard for them to justify that on the Copenhagen criteria. Yeah. And that's and, why and, you don't, yeah. and that's why you don't see similar cultural arguments being raised against Albania. And, 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 and to be Albania honest, are economic ones. Yeah. And to be honest, um, I think something, you know, in this sort of essentialistic argument that, that, that can be made that is sort of forgotten or people don't want to remember is that really one of the largest uh, benefactors and supporters of at least a Turkish ascension process, maybe not a hard timetable, has always been Germany. And Germany obviously has the largest uh, uh, ex-Turkey or Turkish population from Turkey in, in, in all of the EU and probably everywhere in the world, to be honest. Uh, and uh, there's obviously a extremely large investment opportunity in Turkey that really Germany is probably the only state in the world outside of China and the United States that that's actually positioned, maybe Japan, uh, to put the kind of, you know, long term, you know, hundreds of billions to, to sort of trillion dollar investment that uh, that Turkey would need and, and, and be available for. And so the, the, the reality has been um, there was a moment in time, like almost everything that sort of gets lost to history, where there's always been obviously a French, let's say, to be blunt, rejectionist view of, of, of any uh, uh, outside state. And, and, and I think where the anti-Muslim majority uh, with large state politics would reside has always been in, in, in France in, in sort of a strange and sad way. Uh, but I think Germany had done a pretty good job under uh, uh, basically Schroeder and, and, uh, and, and, and early Merkel in, in basically stating the case. And, and I think using its power uh, to sort of, you know, say, hey, you know, we got this. Um, and so there was a moment in time where that was an opportunity, but obviously uh, politics changed in Turkey pretty dramatically. Um, and, and I think that has been lost for a while. Uh, I don't think it's lost forever. I, I really don't. I, I just don't underestimate the economic opportunity of 80 million eventually middle-class, uh, you know, Turkish consumers <laughs> added to the EU. Uh, that is a massive, and, and, and also to be blunt, the military power, right? Because if you really, if you really are honest about European military power uh, and security, it's really the UK, France, and, and Turkey that are basically 80% plus of the non-US combat power in NATO and in, you know, basically in, 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 in Western Eurasia. Absolutely. Um, no, there so was actually um, a funny uh, thing where they did, uh, maybe it was two or three years ago, they did an, an investigation of the German military and they found out that it was <laughs> significantly worse than the already bad estimates that they had had in terms of yeah. their equipment was literally rusting apart. Yeah. And, and it's actually fascinating. The fastest po growing population of of uh, of of uh, non commissioned officers in the German military are actually Turkish Germans, right? Germans, but I mean, obviously, of, of Turkish descent. Yeah. And so there is a very interesting dynamic here. I'm not suggesting this is. It's sort of glacial, 
it's not something that you're going to see in 2022 and it's all solved, but I would not be shocked in 2040 by 2042, given turnover in states and, you know, people really aren't Darth Sidious. They don't live for 500,000 years. Uh, you know, so eventually, you know, there does become new, new leaders and, and, and new points of view and, and that, now, that Turkey gets on a fast track basically. Now we have a new question. If you're a Turkish worker, do you have less legal power working in Germany? Um, if and if Turkey becomes part of the EU, does that worker have the same rights as a German worker? Um, it, mostly, the, that would be mostly, right. yeah, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Um, right now, if you're a Turkish uh, person working in Germany and you're not a Turk and you're not a German citizen, by the way, most Turks in Germany are German citizens. It's That's not, right. they're they're not. Uh, if we had asked in the 1970s, it would be a very different question. But most of them, it's like 90. Most, I think it's like 96, 97 percent. I think what people fused together are other peoples, whether they're from Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, you know, Libya, et cetera, they sort of conflate that with Turkish. And that sort of I, probably goes to that question. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is that the Turkish Germans have a very strong nationalistic Turkish bent um, in terms of their cultural aspirations as a community. Um, so, so people sort of have that have that thought process, but almost all of them, as Aaron points out, are German citizens. So they're workers in Germany as German citizens. So it doesn't make a difference. But if you're talking strictly as an immigrant worker in Germany versus a European Union member state worker, a European Union member state worker has significantly more rights in Germany. And the main issue is that they don't have to worry about ejection, right? Um, in Germany, if you are a foreign worker from, let's say, Cambodia, right, you have to have a work visa. Um, and if you do not comply with the terms of your work visa, like in most first world countries, you will be ejected from the country. If you are a European Union member state citizen, you do not have to worry about ejection because any European Union member state citizen can live and work in any European Union member state. Now, 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 where it gets, there's almost a conflation at a certain point with the U.S., kind of like their version of dreamers, basically. Um, and and then once someone is uh, born there, there becomes there's a whole there's a whole social, um, very much like the United States too. There's a very big social structure that attempts to get all of the sort of rights and services aligned. Uh, from 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 a uh, uh, a a sort of civic perspective, so so the, the sort of civil society is extremely strong in Germany when it comes to um, immigrants gaining uh, as 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 many uh, individual sort of rights and 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 the citizenship uh, levels that are possible. Uh, you know, relative to, you know, to their status. So, and, and I do think there's a, we are in a, a switching moment of like, uh, you know, you see many places in the world and, and, and my judgment on this is pretty simple is, do you have ascending political leaders who have a, the variant ethno uh, religious background and across all the parties, from left to right, you have a uh, Turkish German young, you know, twenties and thirties that are ascendant, you know, new mayors, uh, you know, deputy governors, uh, the equivalent of, of their, you know, sort of county provinces, uh, their sort of city states. So there's, I think we're in this sort of final state where you're going to see very much like president Obama was in the United States. You're going to see, you know, within a period of time, the first sort of Turkish German, you know, chancellor, I mean, we, we've already seen certain aspects like the leader of the Green Party in, in Turkey. I'm uh, sorry, the leader of the Green Party in <laughs> Germany fun, is, actually. <laughs> is, is, is a Turkish, uh, Turkish yeah. German by the name of Cem Özdemir. Um, exactly. And I, there were two comments that I want to sort of bring into the conversation because I think that they really sort of touch on this. Um, during the early part of the guest worker program that brought Turks to Germany in large numbers, the German government was very reluctant to give Turks citizenship. And Germany does not have 
uh, Usoli citizenship, meaning that if you're born on German soil, you do not become a German citizen, in contrast to, for example, the United States, where if you're born on United States soil, regardless of circumstance, you are a United States citizen. In Germany, there is an application process, a naturalization process. It's not immediate. And, 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 and most people don't realize the reason for that was that peak cold war there was two million americans uh you know service people in germany right so there was a you know and and there's a lot of people in the united states uh you know who are probably at this point in their at least their 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 30s to 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 60s 70s that were born in in germany uh and and obviously that never made sense to to have them yeah german citizens no and then the second point is that um in turkey there were a number of laws especially during the 1970s and 80s um, that would not allow people who are not Turkish citizens to own land or other property right. in Turkey. And so those citizens didn't want to give up their Turkish citizenship. So, right, you had the negativity on the German side, you had the, you had the negativity on the Turkish side in terms of what you'd lose. Um, so a lot of them retained their Turkish citizenship. And so most of them are dual citizens still. Um, but uh, to move away from the, uh, the big... Uh, elephant in the room, I guess, and go to, uh, you know, a smaller situation, right? The Copenhagen criteria is not just about rule of law, human rights, and minority protection. You also have to be able to actually uphold the fundamental organization of the European Union from a economic and social perspective. And this is one of the reasons that Albania, despite having been knocked at the EU's door for at least 20 years at this point, has still not been allowed to enter, the economic situation in Albania is terrible. Um, And so the European Union um, doesn't believe that the economy of Albania, under many specific criteria, is capable of being part of a monetary and customs union with the EU. So Albania is also one of these countries that has been applying for a long period of time. And because of these economic issues, has not been allowed to join. So at a fundamental level, there were these two things that became the fundamental basis of the Copenhagen criteria. The first is that you have democratic institutions um, and that you're ruling according to democracy, which is also the reason why Spain was not admitted until the late 1980s. Um, The same with Portugal, because both those countries were dictatorships until the mid 1970s. Um, And than the economic situation. Now the economic situation doesn't have to be as good as France or as Germany or as UK in order to enter the European Union. In fact, most countries that enter the European Union are in a weaker economic position than the majority of the countries that are already in the Union. The economic position has to be such that they are capable of being part of the common market. And then the European Union has a process by which money is allocated from the wealthier states to the poorer states to help bring them up uh, to a consistent level where they would be able to best participate in the common market. Yeah, and and you bring up a very good point. Uh, it, It doesn't really get talked about, but everyone sort of knows it de jour, is that there's a window, a minimum a few years, usually closer to five to, to 10, where it's pretty clear there's an ascension process going on and you see a pretty substantial shift in investment. And that is, um, you know, turns things into very de facto for obvious reasons, right? Because you have industry going in, there's capital uh, expenditure. I mean, you know, there it, things shift from, small, medium-sized business investments to the billions of dollars. And so that drives an acceleration of regulatory policy, statutory adherence. So it almost is a, you know, to be blunt, and if, if you know anything about IR theory, for those of you guys or remember it, it's a form of compellence, basically, that goes on. So there becomes almost... Um, extrajudicial compellence through the business community. And obviously it, it piles on from there into the sort of tourism and hospitality trades. And, you know, it just becomes a momentum driven event. That's what's so unique. And the last point I'll make on, on Turkey that they really decided to do a, a 70s chase movie and just drive off the road and, you know, off the cliff is that that's pretty rare actually. Once you kind of get that momentum going, 
uh, the compellence becomes very strong. And obviously within your own society, because, you know, uh, people are benefiting the business interests, uh, the educated elite, uh, you know, the regular jobs for working class, et cetera, education improves dramatically. Uh, that's one of the biggest benefits, to be honest, is yeah. you start getting uh, your uh, dysphoria to start moving back into your country. You know, all that talent yeah. starts coming back. It's one of the things going on in Poland. Uh, people were talking about a pre-Brexit uh, Polish remigration, anyways, that was starting to happen in the 2010s, just because of how well Poland is doing. Um, yeah, exactly. Now there was uh, there there are comments about Greece. Uh, um, the situation in Greece with the 2008 bailouts is not the process that we're talking about here with this money shifting, uh, and the bailout process was something that was not supposed to happen. That's not a European yeah. normalization mechanism. And we will have a session to discuss the PIGS uh, 2008 economic depression in Europe, uh, because that is a very important uh, crisis that shows how the European Union either works or doesn't work, depending on your- I mean, I mean, to be very blunt, to make it very simple, that was their sort of Lehman Brothers AIG fiasco. And in the same way that it had, you know, extra societal impact um, here, it and it still does, um, whether we even know it or not. Uh, you have the same thing there. It, it, it was uh, it was an it was an own goal. I mean, I think there's no other way to put it. Uh, and we'll get into that obviously in yeah. a future session. So now, after Maastricht, um, the European Union began to incorporate a number of the previous different entities. And so the treaties that formulated those entities as amended um, became part of the European Union treaties and became part of the European Union structure. One of the things that I think is really important to Aaron, um, I, I find it a little bit less important, but it really, uh, but is still very important, is the fact that the European Union never had a formalized single treaty or constitution that organized the system under one coherent framework um, and makes it very difficult to know what the rules of engagement are. And you have to go to all these different treaties and try to apply them together. In a strange way, and, and, and just to make a, a quick sort of point, and maybe that's just a, a generational thing, <laughs> who knows, <laughs> I don't know, uh, is that to become a, a truly engaged member in Europe now, you have this extra layer of administrative state that you have to add. And I believe, I always have, that in any society, when there becomes... Um, sort of secondary costs that it can lead over time to, um, you know, basically a corrosion in trust uh, because people don't see the direct transparency uh, in their lives to, wait, why are we measuring tomatoes in my local grocery store? I mean, and, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I can use a hundred silly examples and we have our own in the US and Canada and Australia but it's nowhere near the volume and more importantly, the speed. I do think velocity matters as human beings, right? I mean, we can take change very slowly and, and you sort of forget about it. But when you ram in, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of units of change in a very short window, uh, you know, we get overwhelmed. And, and I do think the lack of sort of constitutional stability uh, which didn't make sense in 1955 or 1980, but I do think in 2010, 2020, 2030, uh, it makes sense. Uh, there's enough stability, but they don't want to pay the political cost of it, which is right. no, potentially I think, I think, the negotiation. Yeah, I, was say, I think we can discuss that yeah. more towards the end if we have some sure, time. Absolutely. Um, so we also finally mentioned that you had the Treaty of Lisbon in 2007. Uh, it was finally ratified by... Uh, Poland and uh, Ireland uh, in 2009 because the early referenda um, didn't pass and so they had to try and pass it again. Uh, and it unified the various pillars of Maastricht on, into one more coherent European Union. But as Aaron is pointing out, um, it's very different from a constitutional system where you have a single organized um, clear uh, rules of the road for want of a better term. Um, and so there is some flexibility with how the European Union legal system works. So 
one of the things that we need to discuss when we talk about European Union governance is that we are talking about a supra state entity. And we're going to sort of discuss what that means from a legalistic basis in just a minute. Um, we also have multi level governance. And this is something that those who are from federalized states like the United States, like Brazil, um, might be more familiar with, where you have different levels of government with different kinds of um, competencies uh, over which they rule, right? For example, if we take the United States, the United States federal government has exclusive competency on the question of patents. You can't get a patent from your state government. The federal government and the state government have mutual competencies, areas that they share competence in. For example, they can both tax you, right? You can have taxes from the federal government, you can have taxes from the state government. And you have areas of sole competency by the states, right? These are laws that the states can create, but the federal government can't create. For example, when you get married, you have to get a state marriage license. You don't get a federal marriage license because the federal government doesn't define what uh, are the requirements or the organization of marriage. And so you have these split competencies at different levels because of the EU system, right? You have things that are EU competencies, things that are shared competencies, and things that are nation state competencies. And we'll go into more detail about that in, uh, soon. And finally, we have the issue of legitimacy. The European Union is an entity that, as we talked about previously, um, has a number of institutions that are not directly elected by the people. Most of them are indirectly elected because they are appointed by people directly elected in the member states or indirectly elected in the member states if they're part of a party list, right? So there's a question about, are is there a surrender of democracy going on here uh, through the creation of this European Union? And does the European Union have legitimacy given how little individual citizen input it has in its construction. I mean, I would argue there's a subsidiarity that and a diffusion that occurs. And, you know, I, I won't mention my, you know, where <laughs> I stand on the constitutionality of it, but that's sort of the whole point is that because of the lack of consistency and clarity that that subsidiarity and that diffusion of power it almost resembles sort of an old school 1940s, 50s, 60s backroom politics, right? Cigar smoking, right? In that stuff goes in, something comes out and people don't have a sense of, well, why was What's that? What's happening in the black box? Yeah, yeah. What's happening in the black box? And people are basically saying, oh, trust us, we're the experts. And when you're a, you know, a small business farmer in, you know, a French uh, regional province or wherever, it'll tell you, it doesn't matter. You know, you look at that and, you know, you, you, you respond accordingly. It's not irrational, actually. Uh, yeah. and because you go to your local politician, um, you know, or, or it doesn't matter what, what uh, yeah, party you, they're I mean, in. Yeah, you go to the mayor. They just don't have an answer. answer. They're just like, I, you know, they made the call. And then, you know, and, and, and everyone just does this like a kind of an old school cartoon and uh, or comic strip and they're all pointing at each other. And, and that's where I think they have a, a fundamental challenge of, of, of that diffusion and that subsidiarity. And I think they're just afraid of, you know, I don't mean this in the crazy way it sounds. I think they're afraid of the people in that they're right. No, the, a, it, it, there's a very strong Prussian, um, and it's been developed through European uh, psychology that the common people don't know what's best for them and that you need an enlightened group of individuals who are well-educated, who understand the complexities uh, of either economics or development or organization to make the rules that will work best for the best number and be best applicable. But the problem is, is that the European Union is an incredibly varied situation and those who are educated naturally don't know everything that they are supposed to know um, or believed to know um, by dint of their education. They simply haven't had all of the experiences of the various different people of which they're governing. It doesn't mean that anybody could ever have that, but it just means that they don't have that. And so this idea of defaulting to the experts ne doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the right answer or the best answer every time. And that's what and that subsidiarity issue uh, highlights that. Yeah, All right. right. And, and, and I think the, the one last quick point is, is that 
clearly the last, you know, let's say several generations around the world are, are consistently showing that uh, Republican Democratic, I don't mean parties, I mean uh, political um, philosophies and, and, and legal approaches, um, apportionment of, of, of inclusion has consistently borne out that populations are, you know, smarter <laughs> is the simple way to look at it in terms of their sort of crowdsourcing of what really works on the ground and what doesn't work on the ground. And, and it might look messy, uh, but in the end, you get a pretty consistent result all over the world. Uh, whether it's where do we put the train or what do we put, you know, this new school or this building or, you know, a zillion different decisions. We're seeing this uh, and, and a place you're seeing this borne out is really across a, a large part of uh, West Africa right now. It's just, just exploding in sort of diffusive subsidiary uh, politics and uh, might, might not get a lot of press in, in, in sort of uh, Europe and the U.S. But, but I think there's a dynamic that this is the sort of this is the big hurdle the EU at some point has to jump over where they have to be comfortable with the fact that the farmers across Europe, not just French, but everywhere might have really good answers about their needs. And that maybe having a space that that can work out works. And the same thing with urban dwellers, the same thing with, you know, industrialists, et cetera. And that's to me, the, in a strange way, I think one of the, we know what's right of the European design is they did not want, going back to really the 60s, 70s, and 80s, to bring in this sort of what is the rebel. interest based American politics, thinking that that's sort of a unique design, uh, which, if anyone's read history for thousands of years, there's nothing very unique because the Warring States had that in China 20. 300 years ago. And so, you know, humans around interests, I don't think is a uniquely American thing. Anyway, I think, anyway, let's, but, but anyways, um, but, 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 but the point is uh, the last point here is that that really is this gap is interest-based politics and sort of uh, local national politics and larger EU and subsidiarity. That's where the, the, that triangle is where the most of the conflict is basically. That's absolutely correct. Um, now, for the rest of this, we're going to be even more legal than we've been so far. So if you, if you, you know, if you were worried that, you know, we haven't cited enough laws and specific precedents, don't worry, we're, 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 we're getting there. So um, I wanted to sort of put together a number of questions that, uh, that really are touching the legal issues that we're going to be seeing, right? What's the relationship between the European Union and the member state national legislatures, right? We were sort of talking about that shared competencies question. We're gonna get more into that. What are the rights of EU citizens with regards to the expectation that EU laws will take effect, right? The EU law passed in the EU, um, you're right, you have the, uh, the Council of Ministers, you've got uh, the, the members of parliament and they pass a law that the commission has given to them Okay, how does a European Union uh, citizen expect that that will happen, right? Because there's no EU police force that's running around enforcing these laws. There's no uh, EU print shops that are, you know, putting the, the law on the side of, you know, different bus stations. Like, how do EU citizens know uh, that they will take effect? And how can they petition uh, if there's a problem with the effect taking, right? Um, how is EU authority circumscribed? Like what kinds of things can the EU do and why can't the EU do other things, right? Who's gonna stop them, um, right? Then what happens if member states decide to contravene key objectives of the European Union? I mean, we see this today, right? Where Poland and Hungary uh, are disagreeing with European Union uh, initiatives with regards to immigration. So what, what does the EU have as weapons at its disposal to compel observance of certain requirements? And if it does, when should it use them? Um, do member states have the right or permission to nullify EU laws? And if so, how are these delimited, right? How can, do member states have the final say? Does the European Union have the final say? What, what does that look like? How is that, how is that organization built? So as we go through, hopefully we'll be able to 
uh, deal with uh, these questions. So the first one is that I really want to dr drill into uh, what actually happened in the Treaty of Lisbon, right? So that, that's that treaty in 2007, 2009 that modifies the Maastricht Treaty from 1991. Um, and so what ends up happening is the first one is the legal personhood of the European communities comes to the European Union as a whole entity, right? And this means that as a entity with legal personality, it can make judgments, it can enter into contracts, enter into agreements with other member, with other nations and other uh, organizations, right? It's not simply a supranational entity um, that, that sort of exists in its own bubble, but it can actually make its own investments. It can relate to other nations. And so it can sign its own treaties like a company would, right? So this is, uh, so this is very unique because for example, the United Nations can't contract with, I don't know, the Somalian government to, uh, to build something. The members of the United Nations themselves will make relationships with Somalia to build whatever. Um, and so this gives the European Union an incredible amount of leverage in terms of its own negotiating power. The next thing that's worth discussing is the pillar structure. So we had those three pillars um, in Maastricht and those pillars are merged by which, by which we mean that, that we don't have separate councils doing different kinds of policies. All of the policies that the European Union is capable of promulgating are going to be promulgated by the commission, right? That's that executive branch and then given over to the parliament and the council of ministers. Those are the legislative branches, right? And then back to the commission for uh, approval and instantiation. And those can cover uh, not just the European community issues, which are the economic issues, but also the common foreign and security policy issues, which were separate from the European communities, but are now integrated with the European Union. And you also integrate to that the security uh, internal matters, things like criminal uh, information that can be uh, provided through the Schengen agreements and conventions. All of these are unified in the body of the European Union. So now we sort of need to figure out what is the European Union designed to do, or at least what is the European Union's percep perception of what it is designed to do, right? And we see that this sort of mirrors the Copenhagen criteria, and that shouldn't be surprising. This is an excerpt from the Treaty of the European Union, which is the Maastricht Treaty, in which the Copenhagen criteria were proposed. So we see that the union is founded on the values of respect of human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and equality between women and men prevail. Right? So this, um, this sets the groundwork for the vision of the European Union, union as regards the individual citizens of the member states, that they should all be equal, that they should all have human rights, uh, and that the European Union is going to actually work to enforce those rights, right? We, we discussed uh, in the first session about uh, the Council of Europe, which was an organization that implements human rights. And we've talked previously about the European Charter of Human Rights, which is the, basically the Bill of Rights uh, for all Europeans. Um, that are connected to the European Union or one of its subsidiaries like EFTA. So the, uh, the Treaty of the European Union has specified that the European Union has a prerogative to make laws concerning this issue of human rights and to implement decisions regarding those human rights, which gives them a lot of power over the nation states in which they sit with regards to that competency. Um, now, there are other specific competencies that the European Union has. The first one is that, as we talked about, the European Union absorbed from the pillar structure the question of security and justice, right? They, uh, so the European Union is able to regulate and coordinate certain rules with regards to punishments. And for example, within the European Union, it is not permissible to have capital punishment. Um, and 
they also regulated the way in which police copy and share information with each other cross jurisdictionally. As we've also discussed, the European Union has this concept of the internal market to regulate um, the sale of goods between the member states and even within the same member state, right? Because the regulations have to be consistent. If I'm selling a Polish sausage in France and I'm selling a French sausage in France and all things are equal between those sausages, the French sausage cannot get preference in France simply because it's French. And you could say that that's an internal French issue. That's how France decides that they wish to market uh, their agricultural produce. But the European Union actually has a competency here and a suit from so a citizen in Poland who's making that sausage would actually be able to compel within friends them to change the way that they're marketing uh, these kinds of products. And, and, and that goes into this very specific um, set of adherence competencies, which gets, you know, this is where it gets in the weeds and basically drives people insane, um, is that they'll look at, uh, let's say the logo sizing, and the prominence of anything that could have a national representation. So if, if the, uh, anything that is representative of a flag or your nation's colors will have to have a, sort of an adjudicating limit and any other outside party that is competing, uh, it'll go down even into uh, placement in stores uh, which is where, you know, it just turns into, to be blunt, mush, uh, because you have, uh, you know, um, consumer packaged goods companies that are trying to promote their products. And, you know, it just, it turns into, you know, you have to add a sort of a legal layer into every uh, business activity. If you're, to be blunt, if you're, if you're consumer facing, you just have to assume that. Um, and so that's where, I mean, what you could make a very fair argument that a lot of the sort of values norming of trying to create a, a more European um, mindset was a very 70s, 80s, maybe 90s uh, construct. I do think for a majority of people by the 2020s, I think they're smart enough to know when they're buying a Polish sausage from a Hungarian one, from a French one, from an Italian one. And this idea that everybody is sort of a, you know, a, a, like, a, like a country bumpkin and gets tricked into buying their uh, sausage because they're nationalists, because, because the colors come out and that moment triggers your, your, your inner uh, nationalism to acquire that and, and throw the other away. I do think that's a construct that at this point is, is pretty ridiculous. Um, and, and, and so there's an enormous amount of what you would say is uh, regulatory and statutory compression uh, that is sort of reinforcing itself. It's almost its own physics. And yeah. that's where these values and objectives, and this is really back to the earlier point about sort of the friction, like this is where the rub is, is at what point do you almost um, so peculiarize a thing, you know, so a Venetian behavior has been so adjudicated relative to somebody from, you know, right over the Slovenian border to right over the Austrian border. And really these people live within, you know, a, an hour or two of each other. And it, it just becomes almost ridiculous. It's a caricature of itself. And, and that I think is a lot of, the energy is focused on a lot of these activities when they could be focused on a lot more on sort of regional development, to be honest. Um, yeah, no, uh, definitely. Um, there's a there's a funny sort of story, and I think you were alluding to it, but the story between Prosecco and Prosec. Um, uh, Prosecco being an Italian wine um, that's very famous, a dessert wine, and Prosec being a Slovenian uh, beverage uh, that is nothing like uh, it's it's also it's not, yeah it's not sparkling yeah it's yeah sparkling. it's it's it, the two items would not be confused on the shelf save for the fact that the name is relatively similar, and so you had EU patent law. Um, uh, happening uh, concerning those two issues. Now, I have a I have a question with 
considering that statement of values and objectives, how is the European Union dealing with the issue of refugees? Um, Fantastically. Uh, just like everybody <laughs> else in the world, right? No, I mean, I, I think- No, I, I, exactly. The, the idea is that um, the respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, rule of law, respect for human rights and minorities, um, these are for the citizens of the European Union and those which they have freely admitted. That said, um, the European Union does have a number of refugee provisions in terms of how you become a refugee. Um, probably the most common of the uh, commonly cited of these provisions is uh, the first land rule, um, which is that when a migrant uh, or refugee lands within the territory of the European Union, however that happens, the state into which he enters is the one that is required to uh, give him the, uh, the permissions to proclaim asylum there. Um, understandably, countries that are in the northern part of Europe, like Germany, like Poland, um, have less of an issue with this rule than countries that are further south, like Greece and Italy, um, which tend to be the ones that people moving from outside of the European Union who are seeking that refugee or migrant status are usually coming to. And because the rule applies to the land, you have a lot of overnight raids um, or, may, or smuggling raids, I guess you could say, um, going for, from example, from Turkey to Aegean islands that belong to Greece, from um, Morocco to uh, coastal Spain, um, or from Tunisia to uh, Malta or Italy, with the goal of arriving on land before the authorities catch them, and therefore they are part of the refugee asylum system in the state into which they entered. Yeah, and 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 you know, there's this sort of um, you know, whatever. It's every every most rules around these type of things are pretty fake, but it's sort of like the political calculus. There, there's sort of a working calculus, like in many in many countries around the world. Uh, there's almost like a, a standard flow of migration and immigration. Uh, you know, point one percent new entrants or point two percent. And that doesn't really have any friction. It, it almost just happens behind the scenes. But when numbers really get much higher, and typically what it means is the systems are designed to handle that 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, meaning the immigration officers, the legal, the social systems, whatever. So this whole, this, think of it as this whole sort of supply chain. Uh, but when you get five times that number, 10 times the number, obviously those systems fall apart and the news jumps in and, and you know, and, and the chaos or at least the, the imagery of the chaos dominates, that's when there is this fundamental challenge to immigration uh, uh, or the, the volume of it. And then in some cases, you really do have a, a, a substantive change, like when uh, um, Chancellor Merkel, you know, changed the policy in 2014, 15, 16, you know, and uh, over a million or several million uh, uh, people came in. Uh, to Germany, uh, which is a pretty enormous number, right? If, if any um, uh, president of the United States or prime minister in Canada had, had a proportional volume, that would be, you know, uh, 8 million in a year or two in the United States, or that would be, you know, uh, a million almost in Canada or in Australia. I mean, that, that would, you know, there's almost no way that wouldn't impact politics, no matter who, you know, wh who has the government or, or, or where the population is, just because the systems aren't set up to process the scale of that type of change. And so I, I do think that's where the friction is ultimately are um, just the volumes you have. And, and I have a, I'll put a link in here. It shows that the average uh, uh, migration into the EU is, is somewhere between two and 3 million a year across all of the EU, which sort of fits this, you know, 0.4% um, you know, in and out, yeah. yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, I, I have a couple notes in the comments. The first one is that uh, when you're talking about geographic uh, indicators, uh, GIS, those terms can only be called, uh, those terms can only be used in cases where it's coming from that region, right? Champagne wine has to come from Champagne in France, uh, Parma ham has to come from Parma in Italy. And these kinds of things. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and one other quick point on that, that I think um, 
ultimately, you know, science does win out however long that actually takes. <laughs> but um, one of the interesting studies, behavioral, is that, well, this whole idea of, you know, tricking people, which, you know, uh, yes, sure, some people get tricked once, sometimes twice, very few people get tricked 60 times in a row, um, that they found is that if somebody drinks or is expecting Prosecco and they don't get it, they know that. Um, so they bought one bottle of something else. They did have a discovery process in finding out that A, that wasn't that, and B, this is some other new product, and C, and this is the key, is it reinforces their knowledge of what something actually is. So then their adherence to getting Prosecco goes up. And behavioral economics and psychology has pretty consistently proven this. So there is this sort of... Um, let's call it a uh, shift in, in sort of uh, the, the crowd sumer intelligence that I think a lot of these types of rules that made a lot of sense when, you know, regional literacy was much lower, educational attainment was, you know, grades lower, people and were much more- information was parochial. far harder to come yeah, across. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, like basically asymmetrical information was low. I mean, I think today most people have a smartphone uh, and, you know, you see something you don't recognize. And one of the first things you do is search it and figure out what it is. And, you know, it's not some, uh, sci-fi movie where they're out to trick you to get, you know, Croatian wine. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's ultimately, you're going to figure out what you're getting. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be a, a shift at a certain point in a lot of this European identity, uh, or what we call that you know, European identity. So then we had a follow-up comment that every country has their own understanding of how to deal with the refugee problem. It's not quite like that. It's a shared competency, right? The European Union has some of the, uh, some of, has set some of the rules and some of the way that it's done, uh, primarily because they're responsible for maintaining the, mo the movement of people between EU member states, but also the member states have their own internal systems for naturalization uh, and asylum for refugees. So it's a combination of both of these things. Uh, it's a shared competency and the EU tries to thread that needle. And we'll discuss the uh, proportionality and subsidiarity um, which really go into why it's sort of divided this way. All right. Um, we also talked about the economic and monetary union of the European Union, right? The ability to create uh, the European Central Bank and publish uh, the euro notes, right? That's a, clearly a core competency of the European Union. And also we have uh, the European Union's diplomatic influence uh, over the rest of the world. Um, and how the European Union interacts with other member states. We talked about that when we talked about legal personality, right? The European Union does things and says things and is a member in international organizations like the WTO. Um, so the European Union has absorbed in particular the membership in the WTO competency from the European communities, which it replaced. All right, so one of the things that I want to point out is that the European Union has a very strange um, implementation mechanism when you compare it to uh, a treaty. So, uh, sorry, a treaty or a UN resolution, right? So I've got my, um, so I've got my international instrument, I've got my treaty, um, the treaty doesn't suddenly become the national law of a member state, right? I've just ended, let's say, World War I, and I've got my Treaty of Versailles, and I'm so excited to go before the U.S. Congress and say, voila, you now have peace with Germany. And the Congress looks at me and says, no, we need to ratify the treaty, right? We need to, in fact, the United States did not ratify the Treaty of Versailles, right? We made a separate peace with Germany in 1921. But... Um, right, so the treaty doesn't have effect until you have the national measure implementing it. In the case of a treaty, it would be ratification, right? If you have the UN Security Council making a resolution, that resolution doesn't get implemented until there is a corresponding understanding of the treaty implications and a signed law in the United States that would impose the same kinds of situations. At each one of these international institutions, be it a treaty created institution like the European, uh, like the United Nations or a treaty itself, the only method of implementation is if the member, if it is if the state that is involved takes an affirmative action to make that law 
part of uh, its society, right? And then that's how it becomes part of the national legal framework is through the nation itself approving somehow of the international instrument. And what makes the EU different is that there is no requirement for the national governments to perform any implementation acts. As soon as the EU approves a law, right, the commission has finally received the law from uh, the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers, they approve it and it is a law. The European member states do nothing before it is implemented. It is immediately part of the framework of those nation states. They don't have any action to take, which is very unique. And we call this direct applicability and it creates a separate legal order and the European Union law takes primacy. Um, this means that if a European Union law and a pre-existing law in a nation state conflict, the European law takes the lead in that legal situation. So let's say that I have a law in my country that corporate taxes need to be at 15%. The European Union uh, passes a rule that they cannot exceed 12%. Suddenly my 15% income tax goes out the window and that 12% income tax is directly applied in the European Union member state on the date of applicability granted in the European Union law, which may be less than a month uh, after it's been announced. So we've talked before about how a European Union law is made, but it's worth going through the process again. So the first thing is that the commission will send people out to consult and discuss with citizens, interest groups, and experts in order to figure out what would be the best rule to possibly implement, right? This goes back to, as, as I mentioned earlier, this sort of Prussian style, we know best. And so we'll hear what you all have to say and then completely disregard it. So when we do that disregarding, we're going to draft a formal proposal in the commission. That proposal is then sent right, the commission is the executive, and they'll send that proposal to the parliament, and um, that should be the Council of, of European Union, uh, Council of Ministers, but okay. Um, yeah, Council of European Union and Council of Ministers are the same thing, but um, so it's sent to the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers to debate and modify, but generally they approve of the proposal, and the proposal goes back to the European Commission, which makes it an official rule of the European Union, and then once it's a rule, the national and local authorities implement that law, right? Uh, as I said, the European Union does not have its own police force. It does not have its own um, uh, executive agencies that go out to the various states. They require the member states to actually use their own governments to implement the laws that they, that they approve of. And, 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 they, and one mean, other quick Union. point here is yeah. that this is uh, really at the heart, especially in Hungary, Poland last, but especially in Hungary, of, of this uh, concept, which I think has been sort of uh, beaten like a pulp of, of the word backsliding. Everyone uses it, you know, everywhere. My, my, you know, the person delivering the mail is backsliding. I mean, everyone is just, just going nuts with that. It drives me crazy now. But, uh, but, but in this case, it actually applies. Um, is that the concept of backsliding uh, after you've achieved ascension is driving a new, you know, arguably extrajudicial supranational layer of adherence or costs that the EU is attempting to uh, put in place. And one of the handful of instruments it has is its budgetary power. And so it's an attempt to use the budgetary uh, enforcement mechanisms uh, which will be interesting because that, that is arguably a very high escalation, uh, but it, it goes to, you know, reason 14,600 I have around the constitutionality, because if you have the constitutionality, you, you know, you, you would know what, what, what yeah, pe people are bought in at that point. They can complain like we do in the United States about you know, things and we don't even know the name of the amendments, but we, you know, whine and complain <laughs> about a million things. And so people will do that. And I actually consider that normative at that point, right? Because you complain, but you don't do anything about it and because you, you don't even really understand it. So you just, you know, you just roar. 
but there's something different when it feels like everything has an instrumentality that can be adjudicated one off. You can negotiate everything, right? So at the end of the day, there'll clearly be some Hungarian negotiation, which will be different than a Polish negotiation, which will be different one day than a Serbian one and on and on and on. And, and you get this incredibly trifurcated or quadfurcated, I don't even know what the word would be at that point, uh, fragmented um, implementation, uh, which as long as everybody is sort of piling forward, nobody wants to rock the boat, uh, but the boat is always rocking <laughs> by, by its nature. And so I, I think that's one of the dynamics that makes this very real right now, because uh, I think Poland and Hungary, these aren't small states, right? These are states that have a huge uh, set of, of, of responsibilities in, in, in the EU, um, and in some ways are representative of sort of the future growth states within the EU, you know, towards the east uh, or the cent central east, whatever. And, uh, and, and, and I think that's where this friction is pretty substantial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and finally, after the national and local authorities implement the law, or in the case of Hungary, don't implement the law, um, the European Commission and the Court of Justice oversee this implementation, right? Um, the Court of Justice primarily through cases and the European Commission through analysis and further discussions and consultations with citizens, interest groups, and experts. Um, I have a comment that uh, the EU has ruled out that budgetary cut uh, has ruled that budgetary cuts can be made for uh, nation conformance or backsliding. Uh, yeah, that was that was the ruling that just came down about a week or two. Or ago. non, yeah, that was uh, non-conformance. Uh, she hit yeah, the yeah. Uh, she hit the eight instead of the o. <laughs> right oh, I thought she was trying to write nation on a keyboard. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but on the keyboard, the her 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 third her second finger. Uh, hit that. Uh, I also have a comment that limiting migration will end in failure as we are an aging community in Europe. Um, it will end in failure from an economic perspective. Um, there, are, there are other considerations, of course, that, the, that European Union leaders and those who oppose immigration are thinking about when they talk about limiting migration and asylum. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think people overestimate um, the speed uh, that demographic changes occur in. I mean, you look at a place like Japan that has been in a, you know, basically demographic collapse for 40 years. And, um, you know, they still are around and they're still basically the third largest economy uh, in the world. And so um, I, I do think, uh, you know, people overestimate the speed of, uh, of these type of changes, primarily because even when demography sort of switches against you, um, it's not a sci-fi movie, right? Everyone doesn't die on Wednesday, right? They, they still live out their 80, 90 years, and that's a long time, right? So when your demography flips, which is really when your population average age basically gets above 40, really, that's sort of like the simple way to look at it. Well, that's especially with healthcare and so on, that's another 50 years, 40, let's say 40 to 50 years. Um, so you can, you'll, you'll sustain quite a bit over that time. And to be blunt, however, um, reduced or limiting the immigration is to Europe, it is still a net uh, positive in terms of immigration, that those two to 3 million people a year, um, you know, are, are coming in. Um, and we're also not including the ascensions. And if we assume, I do, in the next 20 to 40 years, Turkey will ascend um, to some status, whatever that status is. Um, that'll be, you know, 80, 100, 110 million people. And that's a pretty big, um, you know, uh, uh, green juice shot, you know, of health into the system. So um, I, I, I'm not... Um, I might, I might have negative feelings towards the constitutional stability of the EU, but not towards the broader project. I mean, it's basically yeah. the largest productive uh, coalition of, 
of, of security and economic development in human history. And uh, through the rest of the century, it's going to you know, evolve accordingly. Um, and I think to me, that's just sort of facts on the ground. Uh, you know, you can All get right. yellow So let's, let's so move forward well. a little bit. Yep. Uh, back to the legalism. Yep. Uh, so there are a number of different kinds of laws that the European Union can pass. The first one is a regulation. So a regulation shall have general, this is from the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, that's the Treaty of Rome of 1957 as amended. So a treaty, a regulation shall have um, general application, it shall be binding in its entirety and applicable in all member states, right? So we've got three things going on here that we should really uh, pick out. The first one is that it shall be binding in its entirety, meaning that all that there is no regulation, for example, where part A uh, applies on Mondays and part B applies on Tuesdays. Um, the regulation is something that as a whole law is itself binding and it's applicable in all member states, right? This makes no discrimination between uh, member states, regardless of the capabilities of that member state, regardless of the current economy of that member state, regardless of any of the situations in that member state, which means that the regulation is an incredibly powerful tool, right? Because it means that a law is effectively the moment that, uh, and you can see that below with immediate implementation, as soon as they enter force, they become part of the national law. So if the EU, uh, like for example, right now, wine bottles are at 750 milliliters. The EU can pass a regulation that says, no, all wine bottles must be 850 milliliters and European member states would have to comply by whatever the timeline is to enter that directly into force. And that could be as soon as a month, right? So the, this is an incredibly powerful tool that the European Union has in its disposal. And it's important to point out, as I've had bolded here, regulations supersede national laws incompatible with their substantive provisions. So if you have, right, if we go back to our wine bottle example, if the wine bottles have to be 850 milliliters and you have national laws about 750 milliliter wine bottles, those national laws are now uh, no longer in effect. The regulation has superseded them and has become part of the national law of all of the member states. So we also have another law tool, which is the directive. And the directive is a little bit more complicated than the regulation is. And a directive shall be binding as to the result to be achieved upon each member state to which it is addressed, but shall leave to the national authorities the choice of form and methods. Okay, so this is a little bit more complicated, so let's take this apart. This is, of course, again, uh, Article 288 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. Now, the first part is that we're talking about the result to be achieved. So the directive may have an intention, right? The directive may say the corporate tax rate must be between 15% and 35%, right? So that is a general intent to be achieved. It's not an exact number. It's not like a regulation where uh, you have a clear specification. The next piece is that it is upon each member state to which it is addressed, meaning that a directive may be specified to one member state, it may be specified to five member states, it may be specified to the entirety of the European Union. Unlike a regulation which applies everywhere equally, regardless of circumstance, the directives can apply differently to different member states because of different conditions. So if I have my 15 to 35% um, rate, I could say that this applies to all member states, or I could say that this applies only to the member states of Western Europe and let the Eastern states, for example, uh, maintain a higher or lower rate because to facilitate uh, the economic situation in those countries. And finally, is the bolded part. And that's really the most important part to understand with directives. Um, they shall leave to the national authorities the choice of form and methods. So what we end up having is that a directive will be issued with this sort of variable nature, right? It sets a plan, it sets an idea in motion. And there will be a period of time, usually it's about two years, for what's called transposition. 
And transposition is when the member states have a chance to review this directive and decide what national law they want to create that will match the goals of the directive that is issued. So if we go back to my corporate tax rate example, there's now a directive, your tax rate must, your corporate tax rate must be between 15 and 35%. And now I'm the member state of Spain. Um, I want a low corporate tax rate because I want to incentivize businesses to come to Spain. So I will pass a national law within those two years that I've been given to set the corporate tax rate at 18%. Right, that's within that 15 to 35 percent band, so I'm okay. But I have affirmatively, as Spain, approved this law. So the directive is a weaker tool than regulation in terms of achieving an exact outcome, right? Because there is a national element that is diverse across the different member states. And uh, it can be limited to which member states it applies to, and it has this transposition requirement. So then we have a lot of questions that crop up that don't crop up with regulations. We have questions of, okay, so I'm a Spanish citizen. I've seen this directive that sets the new corporate tax rates, and I see that the current Spanish tax rate is 40%, right? It's outside of that window. Uh, and it's been, you know, a year and Spain hasn't passed a law um, transposing this directive. Do I have a right to sue? Do I have a right to compel Spain to address the situation that they haven't transposed the law yet? What if it's three years and we've now passed that limit on transposition according to the uh, Article 288, uh, sorry, according to uh, that particular directive? Do I now have a chance to sue? What if Spain decides that, oh no, we have to drop the corporate tax rate from 40%, so we're gonna raise it to 70% for the next two years, and the day before the deadline hits, we'll lower it to 35%, right? Because we wanna capture all the revenue we're going to lose by having to lower it into the band by the directive. These are, of course, serious legal questions and the European Union has attempted to resolve them. The first one is that the provisions of the directives cannot be pleaded directly by individuals before the transposition date has expired. So if I go back to my one-year example, right, I've got a two-year transposition timeline. I apply within one year saying, hey, you should drop the corporate tax rate because it's not within the guidelines of the new directive. No dice. Spain has until the end of that transposition timeline in order to correct that. However, if we get to that three years and the guideline and the guideline and the directive was for two years, then this private citizen does have a cause of action against Spain for failing to transpose the directive. And furthermore, if I go to my 75% example, right, where Spain raises uh, its corporate tax rate in order to recoup funds that it will have to lower because of the transposition of this directive. The, this can also be sued. The member states are required to refrain from any adopting any measures liable to seriously compromise the result prescribed by the directive. They have to, at, if they don't move uh, in the direction of the directive, they cannot move in the direction opposed to the directive. So as an example, they can't, and I mean, this is really the heart of it. Also, they can't um, uh, create a tort, an injury towards an outside party. So, you know, they could raise uh, for those two years, you know, 75% out of bound, 50%, whatever to, to, to international companies, but then lower their, uh, their, their, their taxes to 18% for, you know, Spanish national companies and then maybe Malaga has a special tax credit of 8% so that the effective rate would be 10% versus 40, 50, 60%. And that Malaga based company would gain a huge uh, operating advantage so that when the trans uh, position was implemented that you would have resized the market, right? So that's a big, uh, 
you know, that's a big red line actually, uh, and has been proven pretty consistently. It's actually a very strong uh, adherence tool that they have uh, that, that actually I think is pretty effective. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so you have this transposition situation that occurs. Um, so then you might be asking yourself, why would I ever use a directive instead of using a regulation? The regulation is significantly more powerful. And I'm going to add to that the caveat of in the case where I want to target all the member states, right? Because, right, I might, I might choose to use a directive if I don't want to target all the member states and a regulation, I have to target all the member states. Okay. But if I, if I remove that caveat, and I say that I want a law that is going to affect all the member states, why would I choose a directive and not a regulation? This will go to the principle of proportionality and subsidiarity that I'll discuss in a little bit. But the fundamental idea is that the European Union should not take away more power from the member states than it needs in order to achieve the objective that these laws are going to do. So if a directive, which is of course a weaker tool, right, can be used to achieve the right outcome, it should be favored over a regulation, right? Regulations should be used in cases where things like wine bottles being 750 milliliters as a standard, right? Things that are small, minute, but need to be consistent across the European Union. And directives should be favored in things where we want to give more freedom and more openness to the European Union markets and the member states that hold them. So we then have three other things that can be provided uh, as legal implementations uh, from the European Union. The first one are decisions. Right By decisions, we mean the decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union, and a decision shall be binding in its entirety, right? So if you have a decision from the Court of Justice of the European Union, the effect of that court ruling affects not only uh, the parties, unless it's limited to... Uh, in a, it's limited to those parties, that's right, that's a specific decision, you can see that below, um, but otherwise it will be precedential, meaning that it will have effect on future issues of the same type. Now, this is not consistent across European member state law. Um, there's a lot of motion against precedence, for example, in France. Um, by contrast, in the, Europe, in the United Kingdom, there is a strong history of precedent. Of course, the United Kingdom is no longer a member of the European Union, but it was from uh, 1973, the European communities at that time, until uh, 2021. So it's very interesting that most of the states in the European Union don't have a strong regard for a judicial precedent, but the European Union does. And the law and the decisions that, uh, that happen in the European Union have that precedential weight for the implementation of either direct transposition, right, that's regulations, or indirect transposition, that's, that's directives. Now, when you have specific decisions, right, that, for example, we'll say person X must do Y, right, then in that case, only those people will be uh, subject to those specific decisions, and they will not have precedential value. Finally, um, the European Union can provide recommendations and advisory opinions. These are primarily from the Court of Justice of the European Union. But a uh, recommendation is simply a um, spur of the moment interpretation of uh, the current state of European Union law. And an advisory opinion is a more detailed investigation of the specific circumstances under current European Union law. Um, but both of these do not have any binding force. They are simply statements of how those justices believe the law would be implemented in the circumstances given. <laughs> so uh, I uh, still... a, a quick point here. Uh, uh, yeah. Richard, if you don't mind clicking on the link I just put in there uh, a few minutes ago, great charts on laws regs. It's a fantastic sort of uh, simple chart uh, that you can just show for a minute, maybe. Uh, do you uh, see it? Or no? Uh, not yet. So, 
maybe you only shared that. Yeah, yeah. Screen, not your whole. There you go. Um, and if you scroll down, you'll see uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Toshkov uh, put this great breakdown of everything we just talked about since 1970, directives, regulations, decisions, you know, and if you keep going, you can see all the rest of it, uh, you know, which is uh, great because uh, it shows all the different, uh, you know, uh, uh, parties, whether the council, the commission, and then what's amending and new. So it really gives this great um, breakdown of, uh, and then all the different uh, uh, layers. I mean, so obviously, uh, you know, he either really, really, really loves <laughs> European uh, agriculture. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, laws and regulations, or this was part of some, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 research that he uh, must have done for school or, 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 or professionally. But it's a, it's a fantastic breakdown because it gives you a sense of proportion and scale. Uh, you know, when we're talking about the tens of thousands of combinations that exist, maybe hundreds of thousands of combinations that exist. And when you look at all the different languages and all the different uh, national implementations, probably millions. So, you know, it's its, its own industry, uh, to be blunt, uh, very much like you have in um, very large countries like China or the United States, uh, where you have basically an industry, uh, a regulatory industry, really. Uh, it's, it's very similar to that uh, across Europe. Um, and, and I would argue it's thicker in the individual states in Europe than it is in almost any other place in the world in their states or provinces. So in, in you go to a province or, you know, like you go to Malaga in, uh, in, in Spain and, and you're not going to have the regulatory infrastructure and industry or in a place like Idaho, but at a national level in Europe, you'll have this, you know, professional regulatory industry in every single state. Uh, that helps create the adherence uh, given this scale. So anyways, I just wanted to yeah. sort of highlight that and, and give, you know, as a tool for anybody that's really uh, sort of interested in this. So uh, we have actually a couple of questions. So I was curious what um, what some perspectives uh, would be. Uh, one of them is, do you think there will ever be a regulation harmonizing the electrical plug sizes and shapes <laughs> in the European Union? Um, I think there uh, will, actually. Yeah. Um, I think that there will be eventually. I think that to demand it at this point would bankrupt a number of the nations in Eastern Europe uh, yeah. that are that are EU member states. So I think that it's sort of off the table, and it's sort of and it's also something that you would never want a directive about, right? Yeah. The electrical <laughs> wall plugs must yeah. have a certain size and di and diameter. You should <laughs> be with. I mean, the truth area. is that 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 the technology industry, uh, as as things that were never considered to be sort of technology, stoves, refrigerators. Uh, you know, uh, home goods, much less industrial products, as everything becomes semi-intelligent, i.e. connected, um, you know, to networks. I think a lot of this over the next one to two decades gets sorted out because the standardization of the industrialization of the next era of industrialization is called, it's called Industry 4.0. As that happens, uh, I think the standardization just becomes universal uh, in many ways everywhere, actually. So I think some of those things just sort themselves out. Yeah, and I, th I think that if there is harmonization, it will be along um, the model of the German plug, right, which is the, which is the two large holes um, and not having the grounding plug come out but be attached on the sides. Um, but, I, but I think that we're sort of a, a way off from that. Yeah. Um, then we have a question wondering if the agricultural directives are more on the animal side, on the plant side. Well, it's exactly like it is in the United States where one to 2% of uh, subsidies are uh, for, let's say, plant-based centric um, diets and or production. So basically the plant industry is on the market and then the non-plant industries, uh, you know, are, are subsidized between marginal level, 5, 10, 15% to extreme subsidies, you know, 30, 50, 60%. I think Europe has a challenge there just fundamentally because you have so many uh, 
disharmonious agricultural regions and uh, inputs that any construct of a common agricultural policy, you know, will will be decades after there's a European integration of states. I mean, it is just it is fifty to hundred years off because now you're uh, looking at. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, um, sort of. There's a clarification in the comments that they're asking more about phytosanitary. If it's phytosanitary, it probably has a lot more to do with uh, with animals. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, the majority of the regulations. Uh, concerning agriculture are not uh, sanitary, phytosanitary. They are um, budgetary and subsidies. Right. Um, there's also a point that they're sort of raising that it's not just the plugs that would need to be changed. It would be the plugs in people's houses. And that's absolutely right. But what a lot of the EU regulations would require would be for the member states to provide some sort of subsidy to yep. homeowners so that way they could hire electricians who would change those plugs, right? Yeah. And that sort of goes to my argument that this would bankrupt about half of Eastern Europe um, because they don't have the, the kind of money to send all these electricians to everybody's houses. Well, and um, they're also on sort of this quasi Soviet, quasi Western 80s, 90s, quasi European 80s, 90s, 2000 standard. I mean, it's just this sort of mush. And I think there's just a natural sorting out that'll have to happen the rest of the century uh, when it comes to this. I mean, it's basically going to be a, a long-term adapter market. So if you're in the adapter industry, you're probably going to do pretty well. Uh, yeah. So as I discussed a little earlier, the European Union is sort of a federalized entity with competences that exist that are European Union competences, competences that are member state competences, and competences that are shared between both of them. And if we go uh, a little further, we can see what some of those competences are, right? Uh, if we look on the exclusive competences side, these are delineated, of course, by articles four and five um, of the Treaty of the European Union. Um, and uh, they, these deal with the questions of proportionality and subsidiarity. Um, now, the first thing is that when it comes to the exclusive competences, right, we see customs union, uh, antitrust, which in European is called competition, uh, which, uh, yeah, the monetary policy behind the euro, uh, fisheries is also an exclusive competence, which is why Norway is so hesitant about joining the European Union and has stayed in EFTA, uh, because they don't want their fisheries to be regulated outside of Norwegian control. There's the common commercial policy and uh, international agreements and agencies um, are primarily an exclusive competence of the European Union. And there are a lot of shared competences. Uh, we had questions about agriculture and fisheries. Um, agriculture is primarily a shared competence. Um, the internal market uh, has laws that are both um, shared competences and exclusive, uh, yeah, shared competences. So it's both EU and local uh, competences. Um, we've got energy networks, right? You have a lot of European Union laws about the production of and uh, exportation of uh, electrical energy, um, security and justice, uh, outer space and research, um, humanitarian aid, which under which asylum falls, right? We sort of had that discussion uh, and that's why it's a shared competence. And so common foreign security and defense policies are also shared competences. And then finally, we have these supporting competences, which are exclusively uh, in the purview of the member states, but they have something to do uh, with the European Union and its organization. Um, and so the European Union can support the member states in doing these member state competences. So for example, uh, the cultural ministries of the various countries can receive funding and support from the European Union, uh, despite the fact that the European Union has no competence in the culture of the member states. There, there's a, a couple of, uh, I mean, this is a fantastic sort of representation. I mean, we could literally do a whole presentation <laughs> or three on this uh, because it, it really gets to the heart of, of, of the emphasis of the EU um, supranational authority. Uh, uh, and, and a great example of this is sort of the energy policy is that there is not a truly an EU energy budget uh, which allows for really a lot of sort of game theory cost shifting. 
right? So uh, places like Germany can um, have their own green budget, but do a lot of cost shifting, uh, you know, green budget cost shifting to Poland, as an example, or France uh, or others, right? And so there's um, a little, well, not a little, I think in things like energy, there's a lot of gaming uh, that that's going on. So, so there is some real, uh, and you see this kind of in the results of the politics, right? And so most people, most new, sadly, doesn't drill back into this to then say, well, okay, well, what's the design feature here? that's allowing this to happen. And a lot of it comes down to the competency design uh, and, and what its objectives are. Um, you know, so, so anyways, I think that, that and that was sort of an, an example of, of one of those, I think. And the same with education, right? So the whole reconstitution of the, of the Erasmus system, which in a weird way was sort of, sort of like energy where uh, a lot of um, Europeans were going to school, university, unis in, in England uh, and in the UK, uh, because uh, the UK has a fairly developed uh, university system, sort of like the University of California, really. Uh, and many other states um, haven't developed that same sort of system where a big chunk of the population, maybe a third could, you know, could eventually attend. And so they have to reconstitute that, obviously. Um, and, and, it, and that's putting a lot of pressure, to be honest, on education budgets across, uh, higher education budgets across the EU, uh, because you had you know, hundreds of thousands of students um, in, you know, in the UK, maybe half a million in the UK or more. So um, you know, it would almost be the equivalent, imagine the UC system shutting off access, the whole California higher ed system shutting off access to anyone outside of California that would put a lot of pressure on a lot of states in the U.S. to actually have to up their state education game, basically. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I sort of wanted to drill down here is these principles of proportionality and subsidiarity. And so proportionality is the idea that the law should be narrowly created to the aim for which it is intended, right? So Europe, the European Union uh, is required when it makes its laws to organize those laws in such a way that they only do the thing uh, in the least obtrusive way, uh, in, in, sorry, intrusive way uh, to the member state uh, in order to allow the member state to rule effectively. Remember that European Union laws have, su uh, have supremacy over local laws. Uh, regardless of whether they are regulations or directives, right? Directives are just not are direct are just not directly transposed into national law. They're indirectly transposed. But in both cases, you have power over the nation state laws. And so the Treaty of the European Union makes clear that those should only uh, be used to the extent necessary to achieve whatever the aim of the European Union is and not for any ancillary goals. That's proportionality. The next requirement, which is brought up in Article 5, is subsidiarity. And this is the idea that the law should be enacted, quote, closest to the citizen, meaning that we have numerous levels of governance in the European Union from the most broad as the whole union itself down to the nation state. Below the nation state, you have whatever provinces compose that, whatever below that, you have the towns and the cities. And the European Union perspective is that the laws should be created at the lowest possible level that is necessary. Um, sorry, the lowest possible level that can still affect uh, the change desired by the European Union, which is why, for example, tourism, it makes sense to lay, make that a national competence as opposed to a European Union super state competence because tourism is more effectively managed at a local, either national level or regional level within the nation states um, than it is at a European Union level. Imagine trying to advertise a, a beach vacation, um, you know, in, in, in Stockholm, um, because you had a unified European Union tourist ministry that is trying to promote beach vacations all across the European Union. And conversely, skiing on Mount Athos is probably not the best goal, is not the best goal of a European Union tourist agency. So uh, this uh, subsidiarity principle allows more of the laws to be created locally. And these two ideas of proportionality and subsidiarity 
are the reasons why regulations to the extent that they are used are very narrow in terms of their scope. Um, you know, so they don't have a proportionality issue. And because it is the power of the European Union, they're used, uh, the, there's a desire to use directives in order to allow that subsidiarity principle, right? You allow the different member states to implement slightly different versions of the same objective. So that way the law matches the citizens more than if it were done at the European Union level as a, as a regulation. Now, if we look a little bit more closely at the divisions here, you can see when it comes to exclusive competence, the member states are not allowed to implement laws in areas of exclusive European Union competence, which means that the member states cannot, for example, make their own Euro policy. If uh, all the different member states are required to print a certain percentage of euros based on their relative weight in the economy. For example, Germany prints about one third of euros in circulation. Germany can't just print five times what it was expected to print because they need to deflate their currency to pay foreign debts, which some countries in the European Union have a history of doing uh, prior to the euro's existence. I'm not looking at any Hellenic republics here. So um, what, uh, the European Union has the exclusive competence in choosing how much money is being printed. So Germany can't make that decision on its own. Conversely, when it comes to the shared competence, we have three different categories, right? We have, the first category is member states that can exercise a competence in a certain jurisdiction uh, and a certain competence. However, they cannot exercise their lawmaking in that competence if the union has already spoken. Remember, primacy accords to European Union law. So for example, if we look at environmental law, if there is a regulation or a directive on point from the European Union, that area is off limits to the member state to legislate about. However, the European Union and uh, the European Union uh, regulations and directives don't cover a large amount of environmental regulation. And so there is environmental regulation that can be approved at the nation state or member state level. Now, there is types of competence where the European Union uh, may have primacy, but that primacy does not exclude anything contradictory coming from the member states. And you can see that this generally occurs in areas where every regulation is itself an aggrandizing um, aspect, right? You can see with environment, those are usually negative regulations. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you must do that. When it comes to the development of research, the promotion of international cooperation, humanitarian aid, these are always expenditures on behalf of the European Union and expenditures on behalf of the member states. And so no uh, expenditure from the European Union precludes an expenditure from the member states in these institutions. There is, of course, if we're doing, talking about something like the ESA, the European Space Agency, there is work that both of these are doing together. And so you need to have open lines of communication just from, from a functional perspective, but you don't need it from a uh, legal perspective, the permission from the European Union to also uh, work in these fields. And finally, um, the European Union helps to implement common policies with regards to foreign security defense issues um, that while they are typically not competencies granted to the European Union, the European Union provides a forum for creating those common policies. And that's, for example, where we're seeing some of the issues concerning how the European Union will respond to direct threats. Um, and, we have... And, and, oh, go ahead. And, and yeah, I go think ahead. One, uh, one thing that's important is that in the last few weeks, the ruling on the infringement procedure uh, with Poland, where basically... The, um, the Polish government has obviously, and it was sort of obvious that it was going to accept it, uh, you know, the, the premise of, of, of European directives and, 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 and laws and, uh, and, and procedures, uh, which I think is uh, an interesting case. Um, I, I, I think that will set um, in motion a lot of pressure towards Hungary next um over the next i think year or two uh, and and that will i think in some ways settle a lot of these challenges i actually think it was an important 
um, process to occur and to occur publicly, uh, and ultimately to have you know Polish and, and ultimately it'll be Hungarian uh, adherence. Uh, you know, and 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 I'm sure there'll be over time adjustments to the directive uh, processes to include more. Um, perspective from Central and Eastern Europe, which I think is ultimately, I mean, they, they did it in sort of a ham-fisted way, but I think it's, that's what they're ultimately saying is that, look, you can't, you can't expect us to make this little iterative incremental jump the way Paris or Berlin can when we haven't done these other 50 jumps that they did over the last 30 years, 40 years, and you're expecting us to make in one leap or two leaps these massive implementations. And uh, I believe that's completely fair. Uh, and I think the, the challenge is the EU doesn't have a great mechanism uh, to, to bring that to pass. And so it had to shift to this very sort of existential one, which I think is just a, you know, lack of adults in the room basically on all sides. So I think over time, that's going to be a, a shift is that there's going to be a in the, in the US or in other countries, we would call it sort of when you mark up your bill in committee, right, there's going to be a lot more of mechanisms for those processes to occur that gets to interest politics, right, which the EU has really tried hard not to uh, develop. Um, so I think in the end, they're going to go down that path because the alternative is these type of conflicts, basically. So uh, one final thing that I wanted to address before we go is on the question of legal primacy uh, of European Union law. So we've got two different types of European Union law. The first one are the treaties, right? The Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, the Treaty of the European Union, and several others, and the binding norms. These are the laws of the European Union, such as the treaties it uh, creates with other entities, its directives, regulations, decisions, and both the EU treaties and the EU binding norms are superior to national laws, as we've discussed. But national constitutions can supersede the EU binding norms in specific limited cases. Now, there are two cases that are really important to understand in terms of understanding how powerful legal primacy is uh, when we're talking about the European Union. So uh, in the case of Costa VNL, um, basically, this was a case where uh, there was a national law that was operating in contravention to uh, one of the, I believe it was a directive, but it may have been a regulation, it doesn't matter for, for our purposes. Um, and so this domestic law was operating in contravention to the directive um, that was in state. And the court said that specifically that cannot stand any case where there is a law that on its face or in its intent um, overrides or fights against the primacy of the European Union law must be retracted. And if it is not retracted, the courts must assume and operate as if it has been retracted, which is a very powerful power to give the European Union because it supports the idea that we've talked before I talked about before that the regulation is transposed immediately and replaces whatever na nation state law exists. And after the period of transposition has expired on a directive, the directive's goal and intention becomes the law of that European Union member state um, if it hasn't been transposed. And the European Union citizens can expect that uh, European Union law will be in effect. Uh, and the other case that I wanted to bring up is Simmental. And Simmental uh, brings up a very interesting European Union issue when it comes to precedential law. So those viewers who come from the United States are probably familiar with the idea of judicial review, which is where if a court hears a case, the court is actually able to change the law sua sponte from the, from the judgeship and actually say what the law is now that the previous law was deemed either unconstitutional or in contravention to existing legislative intents. So you will then walk out of that courtroom in the United States with a new law now existing, which is why US lawyers routinely 
uh, search up case law, right? They look for these rules that have been created by the various courts because those explain how the law is to be implemented and in cases where there were no laws uh, previously, those cases create that basis of law. This process of judicial review generally does not exist in the European Union member states, especially not France and Germany. The courts are required to implement the law as written without recourse to the power of judicial review. So in this case in Simmental, we had a situation where the law was not uh, transposed. And so the previous nation state law was still in effect. And the court, because it does not have the power of judicial review, was operating under the basis of the previous national law. The judgment in Simmental says, no, you courts in the European member states have the requirement to rule as if the law were transposed and you do not have the authority to wait until the legislature remedies this issue, which is what they would typically do with their national domestic laws. Um, you have to implement the law through your jurisdiction, uh, through your judgment on this particular case. And you have to act as if the EU law has been transposed, which again uh, is, a, is a power those courts don't even have with regard to their national laws. So, um, so this is an incredibly strong power uh, that is undergirding the primacy, legally speaking, of European Union law. And uh, that's, that's my presentation. Uh, do we have uh, any additional questions or comments, Aaron? Um, no, it's fantastic. Uh, do you want to open up uh, for, for people uh, who want to sort of speak right now? We can just do... Yeah, if, if you want to speak, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Yeah. Um, and by the way, uh, I'm, I'm sure your uh, Master of Laws, uh, Master of European Laws uh, professors would be very proud of your presentation. Uh, I, I hope so. Uh, so. Some of it's theirs. Exactly. Exactly. And and you would show them that you were actually listening, <laughs> and and not planning on uh, on your next coffee break. So I think that's uh, that's great. I, I um it, it, until we get some questions, uh, um I, I do think it hopefully it allows everybody now to understand to some degree these uh, different. Uh, structures and you can and, and the test of this I, I put in here a a uh, an infringement procedure press release <laughs> and 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 it really does adhere uh, to what we talked about here I mean so that you could you know uh, a week ago this might have looked like complete gibberish uh, and now you'll be able to understand probably three quarters I mean really you better drill through all of it if you wanted to not that you probably will but as 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 you uh, you know clearly anybody attending this is interested in the EU and and interested in its sort of development um, and and so going forward as you consume news or information you'll be able to really process um, I think a lot of it um, the more you understand sort of the legal structure uh, because some things seem like they come out of nowhere. And the truth is very little in the EU comes out of nowhere. I mean, it's, it's, it's arguably the most um, instrumented uh, political uh, architecture maybe in human history uh, with the least amount of, uh, of sort of um, variation. Um, it, it's one of its challenges, right? They, they, they come up with a new, whenever there's variation, they come out with a new um, organization that deals with the variation and basically puts it into boundaries again. And then, you know, you just keep going. Uh, that's, I think, I think that's one of its strengths and weaknesses really in the end. Uh, All right. So I guess uh, we're not, uh, we're not seeing any comments, but uh, yeah. so our upcoming sessions for the next few months, will focus on the crises of the European Union. So Aaron and I will have to get busy putting together all kinds of pretty slides 
um, concerning economic downturns, collapses, riots, and uh, and and migration. Lots with. of yellow vests. If anyone has a yellow vest that they could, I'm going to try to dig mine out of uh, out of the garage. Not it's not a full yellow vest. It's one I, I used uh, for kids for soccer and stuff. But if I can pull one out, uh, just when we when we talk about that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, and, and and by the way, any of you that are interested. Um, you know, to add to sort of the lists of crises or ones that you uh, believe are crises, please let us know. Uh, put it in the comments here or in the comments in the in the meetup, uh, and we'll try to add those because we really want to make this uh, sort of. Uh, a, a yeah, there's a question of can we uh, watch previous uh, videos of the presentations? You absolutely can. Yes. I'm going to put a link to. Uh, we we would love to have more air time and more space <laughs> in your heads. Um, uh, I will put a link to the playlist from Zach's YouTube page. Uh, that is our. Th this will be our third um, uh, EU presentations. Um, and you can watch them back to back, side to side, um, however you want to spend, you know, that, that six hour glory fest. On your phone, you know, while you're going at the grocery store, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, exa exactly. Make, make your boring, boring day even more crazy. Okay. Um, so your you therapist, have, anything, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> there was a question about, can we include the 2014 uh, Yanukovych presidency in the Ukraine crisis? Um, uh, Aaron, Aaron's uh, primarily going to be behind that. I think that, I think uh, not including Yanukovych and Russian attempts to coerce uh, Ukrainian um, subservience to the Kremlin um, would be really remiss in presenting that. So while I can't guarantee that it will be in there, I'd be very surprised if it weren't. Well, so so what? just so you know, uh, uh, I'm going to be doing a presentation and it'll be the reverse of this one today where Richard will be supporting um, in a few, but probably about three weeks. Uh, I'd to be honest, I've been trying to time it when there's more finality to events, uh, but at a certain point, you just have to sort of pull the plug. Uh, and then that'll be a presentation just on the history of this whole uh, Ukrainian, Russian, and really sort of post uh, Cold War, um, you know, um, path that, that we've been on for the last 30 odd years uh, and, and Ukraine's been on. And, and, and then what I'd like to do is maybe put a uh, summary slide out of that in the crisis so that anybody who wants to really drill down can listen to the presentation, watch it, whatever. And uh, we'll have it as one of our maybe eight, 10, 12, you know, crises of the last, uh, you know, 20 years. Um, we we actually, we actually got another question. And okay. uh, the question is, uh, what do you think are the best and worst aspects of the European Union? Um, I would say that the best aspect, in my view of the European Union, is the creation of the single market and the yeah facilitating mechanisms of maintaining the single market. Um, that has raised the European economy very, very much uh, in terms of its financial ability, the ability of European industry to unify, um, the creation of large scale sales, the free movement of people. Um, by, by doing this has really accelerated Europe's development uh, in the post-World War II economy and has effectively prevented a uh, war by so uh, thoroughly enmeshing uh, the economies of the European member states. So that to me, the creation of the single market and the enforcement mechanisms that keep the single market working, I think that's the greatest um, positive of the European Union. In terms of its negative, um, I would say the biggest negative of the European Union um, is primarily that um, you have a lack of democracy and a lack of transparency. And so that means that people don't trust European Union institutions. They don't trust um, what the European Union represents. And given the power of these directives and uh, regulations in terms of their ability to change people's lives, that lack of account public accountability um, really makes the institution look less legitimate um, than, than it probably should. And, and, and I, everything Richard said, uh, what I call kind of the EU 1.0, um, and to put it into context, I would say, um, you know, with the development of the Chinese economy in the last 40 years, uh, warts and all, uh, the development of a truly integrated United States economy, which really didn't happen until really after World War I, uh, the development of the European, of the EU 1.0 is uh, one of the three greatest uh, market making events in human history. 
Uh, it, it maybe doesn't feel that way because we can always throw up 250 things that don't work or 250 million things, uh, but compared to what, right? You have to have the comparable, right? And, and so um, I think the 1.0 uh, is totally true. I do believe this concept of a sort of a, you know, this is my invention, a 2.0, which is a very powerful sort of regionalization uh, or what is called an economic sort of uh, mega regions or agglomeration. This has to become the future of the EU uh, uh, developmentally over the next um, 30 to 50 years because the actors are executing that way because that's how people really live. That's how companies really work. That's how things actually happen. So I think that's this big shift. I also believe um, just like uh, Richard said and all the transparency issues, uh, the building of that constitutionality um, is very important. And I would say lastly, uh, the full integration of Central and Eastern uh, Europe um, and ultimately the other uh, states that are sort of uh, uh, on the periphery uh, is absolutely central and the investment for that, right? That's not just, uh, we're gonna send some lawyers and PowerPoints to tell you what you should do. Uh, no offense to lawyers and PowerPoints. I was gonna uh, say that worked very well in Transcaucasia. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, actually bringing, what it really boils down to is bringing uh, people, expertise, uh, to those places and bringing people from those places to the expertise and educating them, right? I mean, getting them, you know, law degrees and economics degrees and, and uh, you know, what we call public administration degrees, you know, the, the real, the, the kind of stuff that people blow off is because it's boring. It's not fun to talk about, but it's, it's what actually makes the fiber and makes things real. And that's this next shift that has to happen. If it doesn't happen, if you don't have that investment there, and we're talking about building basically millions to tens of millions of people who know how to do these things, you're just not going to get this stuff to work, right? It doesn't magically happen, right? There's not an app you download and now you're, you're, you're executing the EU. I mean, that doesn't exist. It's, it's, it's human beings having the agency and development to do these things. So to me, that's the next wave and uh that's basically the rest of this you know probably 50 next 50 years in in europe um and and i believe they'll do it it'll look ugly like most things uh but it'll ultimately happen um you know because they're all in i mean whether they don't seem that way administration to administration the, the there's no off-ramp right i mean there's just no off-ramp uh i mean you have a a, a small population that screams about an off-ramp like you might in the US or Canada or a million other places. Uh, but the, that population doesn't have any real support. You know, the, there's no there's nobody backing an alternative plan uh, that is the off-ramp of the EU to de-EUize itself. So, you know, that's just not gonna happen. It's only this direction. Um, you know, so I, I do think this decade is gonna be a real big test because there's a big institutional, there's a legacy set of institutions. Uh, there's a legacy set of people, age-wise and experience-wise. There's a new generation coming in. I would say just like all new young generations, very excited and also very somewhat to be blunt, very naive. And they are gonna have to gain the experience of the ugly deals, the ugly compromises. And, and can they do that? I mean, can they actually just suck it up and do that? And can the legacy uh, adjust from their sort of uh, self-centered uh, view and somewhat elite view of, you know, the people are the, are the dangerous thing here? Um, and to me, that's going to be the test this decade in the EU. It, ultimately, they'll pass. It just might waste another decade because they don't have any other direction in the end. Um, you're not going to float 30 more currencies. Um, and, and one of the things I do believe you're going to see this decade, and this is, and you're already start, starting to see it a little bit on the edge with COVID, is there will be a new euro bond market. And when the euro bond market happens, it's game over, right? Because you're not going to, like, that's it, right? Because once states are accumulative in that debt, you don't have a mechanism to get out get of it. That's it. That's done. I mean, you're not going to go back to the stone ages so that you can wave your flag. I don't care what people at 
a Sunday breakfast, say, you know, push comes to shove, you're not going to defund your whole institutional existence. Um, and that's going to be, I think, the big shift. And they know it. And they're scared. Everybody's scared because they all know this is, this is the moment of truth. Very, by the way, I argue, any of you that watched uh, the Hamilton shows or ever read about it, this is their Hamilton moment, basically, because that's what Alexander Hamilton, he wasn't he wasn't clueless. He knew what he was doing. He understood if you could lock, interlock that debt, a national bank, et cetera, um, you sort of lock in the union itself. And I believe this will be their Hamiltonian moment. It'll be uglier, but it'll still happen, basically. Yeah, when, when, when you lock those wigs, it's, it's not nearly as pretty. But, uh, <laughs> But on, on, that, on that note, um, I think uh, this, uh, this should be our sign off and um, we'll pick up, I believe our next date is on the 13th of March. Um, let me just pull up the- And meetup. by the way, all of you get your crises questions or topics in, uh, whether here or on the meetup page, and we'll really try hard to sort of pick the you know, whatever big 10 of, you know, list of 10 or whatever that number is and, and, and try to really cover them and give them justice. Yeah, so I'm just gonna get the link for our next session and put it. Um... Oh, by the way, did you, did you put the, the link to the YouTube videos in here also? No, I was gonna, I was gonna put those in the actual meetup page. Okay. Um, but there may be people here um, who don't, uh, or who are not members of the of the Meeting group. Page. So let's yeah, 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 yeah. So let's put that in there. And and Zach, um, do you you have the link on YouTube to the meetup group, don't you? Because we should have that in the show details, just so everybody can come back from meetup to YouTube and vice versa, so that everybody can kind of go both directions as they refer people. I was gonna say we, we we might have to add that at some later point. Yeah. But I think it's going to be Sunday, uh, the thirteenth of March. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, and so, by the way, there's a, a few. I'll, what I'll do is I'll add it here and then try to do it in uh, a few other places. There's a, a bunch of fantastic. Um, uh, EU sort of news content uh, that's out there. Uh, you know, basically their ver I don't say their version, but versions of sort of like the BBC, but from an EU perspective, uh, you know, and, and sites that are sort of roaming out there throughout uh, Europe that I think are pretty good. I mean, they, they, they either are light on opinion, but heavy on sort of um, volume of, you know, sort of European news. Uh, so, so they'll have, you know, 30, 50, 100 categories uh, curated, but that's it. So it's kind of raw um, or they'll be heavier on opinion um, and, and detail and, and, and sort of topic. Uh, well, I'll try to include as many of those as I, I put one in here uh, that I, I, it's one of the five or 10 I like, actually. It's um, you just sort of cherry pick the opinion stuff, which I don't tend to focus on anyways, but they're, they, they load you up with sort of Euro news. Uh, and there actually is Euro news. <laughs> so that's a good one too uh, on YouTube. And then France 24 and Deutschwelle DW uh, is really good also. So, you know, both website and YouTube. So most of these news sites now have a, a YouTube channel and they also have a mainline traditional sort of website or app that you can download. Um, and you can get all your EU European news fixes you want. Um, so, um, I put in the, uh, in the meetup chat, if you want to download it, this is the zoom link for 2 PM Eastern time on 13th of March. Um, that is going to be our next European union presentation, um, where we start to talk about the crises, uh, after just doing a quick summation of what we've covered in these past, uh, three, uh, discussions where we've gone through the history institutions and uh, legal structure of the European Union.
So let's just give you a few seconds to download that if you want to copy that link, and then we'll close this out. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Alan. Amazing presentation. Well, thank you, Zach, right. for putting the, the whole thing together in terms of uh, uh, Jennifer, I'm going to put a link. It, it, do you have a link to the actual original meetup page? Because if you have a link to the original meetup page, I will put um, the YouTube playlist on the meetup page. All right, so um, that's it, I guess. All right. Yeah, and then and then uh, we'll make sure we put these.